Nee. That was the last time you were at the race, Ismer. Well, I've never been on a horse successfully in my life. Where shall I put my lettuce? Oh, you lettuce. can have the lettuce. Okay, it's sketchy politics. The race is on. Well, Robert, everyone needs a break in their routine, so I thought we'd have a day at the races. Absolutely. There is, there is no metaphor we're not prepared to use. <laughs> Absolutely. No cliche we won't stoop to. We're now into 2024, the year in which an election must be called to be within the five years. And some of the rules of the race have changed. So I thought we could explore the runners and riders. And while I do that, maybe you'd like to sort of peer at them. Yes, assess absolutely. Assess their form. Put them miles you know, away. Whether they've been miles or... trained. Mm. So what we've got going on here is, obviously our two main challenges for the cup, the cup being Downing Street, Sunak and Starmer out in front. Uh, I've got the horse right here. Yeah. The name is Starmer here. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so I wanted to try I and also, explore. I have to say, I yeah, think... go on. I think this is actually Rishi Sunak's horse at the moment. <gasps> we have the old push me pull you because he's riding a Conservative Party that wants to face, I think, in a number of different ways. And as you know, in a straight race, that could be a disadvantage. Shall we have him on the push me pull you? Let's have him on the push me Let's have him on the push me. Okay, you can bank your Rishi going in mm. one strategic direction, perhaps for later. And then obviously we've got the Lib Dems, we've got the two national. You've literally got Ed Davy winning. You have no, 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 okay, got Ed Davy okay, winning. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. He should be. Right back there with his little mm -hmm. Lib bird. We've got the SMP, which I'm going to put sort of here near Sunak because that's a fact. That we've also got Richard Tice and the Reform Party. Used to be the Brexit Party, yep. used to be UKIP before that. And we've got the Welsh Nationalists, Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalists. And we've got the Green the Party, Green, yes. which I'm putting behind Keir Starmer because I think we're going to have a bit of a discussion about, you know, whether they might be yes. a, a factor this time. So the race is sort of almost upon us, but some of the rules of the game have changed. One is the parties are allowed to spend much more. It's going up from around 19 million per party to 30 odd million mm -hmm. per party. You've got voter ID and you've got expats being allowed to vote if they register in time. You've got various sort of changes and also boundary changes, which means a couple of fewer seats in Wales, Scotland and changes in England. How much do you think the Tory party, beset by this push me pull you on its strategy, is sort of trying to change the rules of the game to its own advantage? Because there are, are those that say all of these individual changes put Sunak's a little bit ahead to compensate for where yeah. he is in the polls. Well, look, you can make a case for any of the individual changes. The one thing we know for sure is the political parties do not change the rules to their disadvantage. Right. So, you know, if the Conservative Party thought that voter ID or higher spending limits or changing the expat rules were disadvantageous to them, then they, they wouldn't, wouldn't do be it. doing it. Yeah. Boundary change is obviously a different matter. They come up in intermittently. The boundary changes, I think it has always been said that they probably give the Conservatives another five to ten seats on the 2019 election. But it does just make the comparisons a little bit harder. So essentially, on the boundary changes, it might make a tiny bit of difference here and there, not enough to compensate for a party no, that's way behind. Not in the current opinion polls. The other point I think is interesting, though, that I think Conservatives have made possibly a tactical error, is the Labour Party is, I believe, currently committed, I have to check it, it does move from time to time, <laughs> currently committed to votes for 16-year-olds. So actually, the Conservative Party have done all the things you mentioned, and of course they've changed the electoral rules for mayors and things like that. So it makes it much harder when the Labour Party come in, if they come in, and say, well, we want to cut the voting age to 16 for the Conservatives to go to, object. to get all high and mighty. Yeah. Oh, no, no, you can't mess with the electoral yeah. system. So because voter I ID, if it was worth it. The voter ID change, the Electoral Commission said that in 2023's local elections, 14,000 people could have been stopped from yes. exercising a vote they wanted to. So if that disadvantages younger people, as we think it might, it's not great for the Labour Party it, in a, some it, seats, maybe. I think it's a real issue. And, yeah. and you know, I think we'll see some major campaigns to make people aware of what the rules are. Also, the idea that you can use is rather rigged against younger voters. It's not nice. Right, OK. So at the moment, we've got a situation where the polls being what they are, Keir Starmer looks like he's way, way out in front of mm -hmm. Rishi Sunak. And it's a consistent sort of 18 to 20 yeah. point lead in the polls. Yeah. It seems like a lot, but obviously in a campaign that does that usually, usually, usually narrow. narrow. So we would expect that sort of thing to happen. But how much do you think? Well, I mean, what these are you... questions that I, I think yeah. Keir Starmer is sort of 
ambling along on his horse, not moving very <laughs> fast. Just, well, just carefully, pleasantly, pleasantly, carefully, carefully cantering, avoid, avoiding even, dangerous yeah. tufts. And the Conservatives are just moving backwards. The Labour poll lead is essentially the Conservatives undertaking them over the last two years and getting further and further back. So It's the Tories losing the Tories as losing much it. as the and, Labour you know, Party winning. It's very clear we've got to that point, and, and you see it sometimes in, 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 in life cycles of parliaments, where even when a political party is saying what advisers and strategists and opinion polls say is the right thing to be saying and doing what they say they are told they need to do, the public has so lost interest in them, so doesn't rate them, that it doesn't matter that they're saying what voters want to hear because they think they're not listening. you won't do it. We're not, not listening. listening. And I think yeah. that's where the Tories have got to. It's a terrible place to be. And Labour, for that reason, is trying to leave as few hostages to fortune as it possibly can because it just thinks it can amble across the finish line. But before we get to the finish line, there are sort of some hurdles, as it were, Nee, that Starmer would have to jump. You hurdle the finish line. Just, that That's was the not... last time you were at the race, isn't it? Well, I've never been on a horse okay. successfully in my life, I have to say. OK, let's make it a, a hedge, hedgy fence. It could be a flat race. It doesn't need A hedgy fence. That's yeah. not the finish line, OK? okay. That's a hedge. So one of the hurdles that it appears Starmer's got to get over is this question of having promised an enormous industrial strategy with a huge price tag attached, mm. £28 billion for a green industrial revolution, which this is only... £28 billion a year. Yes, by the end of mm. the first five-term parliament, which is one of the only things that the Tory party is successfully kind of hammering him on at the moment. Do you think that this is something, you know, where the horse is in a way kind of refusing, you know, to get over this hurdle at it's the a moment? Very, it's a very odd one, this, because obviously... This was introduced a couple of years back. Yeah. It is one of the very few clear policy proposals that Labour's got that's been sticking with for a couple of years and people have begun to internalise. Also, 28 billion is a very odd figure. You normally say 30 or 25, 28 billion. Um, nobody knows what 28 billion is. It's just a lot. Huge. It's a yeah. lot. If it had been 20 billion, we'd be having the same conversation. But the Conservatives see an opportunity here to say... Labour is going to borrow very, very heavily or tax very, very heavily to do green things that you don't really care about the public when, you know, you would want that money spent on health or anything like that. So it's a concern for some Labour strategists that there is a weakness here. They haven't maybe been emphasising that it's no. for jobs and creation. They haven't talked about what it means. It's, it's just the it's money. It's manufacturing, it's, it's the, employment, yeah. it's reinvigorating local areas to carry on that levelling up strategy that hasn't homes. delivered. Insulating homes, yeah. And they haven't managed to get that across. It's just the number. And that's now been scaled right back to much less, 4.7 billion. It's the price tag being the story is the problem yes, rather than the policy itself. OK, I think they've also got this other problem at the moment, which is the left yes. and discomfiture with Starmer and the shadow cabinet stance being shoulder to shoulder with the Tory government on support for Israel over Gaza. And we have this potential figure from the past yes. coming back to uh, haunt the Labour leadership. Uh, George Galloway, who has stood previously against Labour, Twice From beaten the left. in the by-election, once yeah. failed in battle. And they're really nasty campaigns when he's in. They're really poisonous campaigns where he goes after the Labour Party. And he thinks there's an opportunity to humble Keir Starmer in the Rochdale by-election, significant Muslim population which he's targeting, that is dissatisfied with Labour's position over Gaza, and he thinks they can deliver a blow to Keir Starmer, if not win the seat, at least dent Labour's vote enough to move its policy. And by the way, this goes back to the green issue, because yeah. where are the voters who aren't going to go to respect, which won't stand in very much? He's not called respect anymore. I think he's called the Workers' Party these days. Um, Whatever the Galloway vehicle where, becomes. Where, where yeah. are they going to go if there isn't a Galloway candidate? People who feel that agitated and want to go to the left of the Labour Party, the Greens are the most likely vehicle, which yeah. is another reason for not dumping the yeah. Green strategy, which you might be able to use to squeeze the Green vote in a general election. The whole Labour strategy has always been, we've got a group of people to the left of us, they don't really like us, they liked Jeremy Corbyn, but when we get to the election, it's us or the Tories, and they'll fall into line, most of them. And which, that's which, normally a bankable fair, strategy. To be fair, that is what tends to happen at general yes, elections. that's right. But there may be factors that Especially if they think if people think that Labour's way ahead and they can afford to be a little bit more demonstrative in, in the way they vote. We should explain. There are two riders on the Green Horse because they have a co-leadership strategy yes, the Green Carla Party. Denya and Adrian Ramsey, as everybody... Of Everybody, all um, our viewers will know that. And uh, it, it, to be fair, the Greens change their leaders quite often, so one does have to one does have to keep up. I think it's fair to say none of them has yet cut through to the public, <laughs> um, so they've got a bit of work to do. But um, but in a way, they don't need to <laughs> so much because it would be disaffection with the Labour direction Absolute. that was that was yeah. Absolutely, those two issues around the left mm. are a problem for um, Keir Starmer in England, and obviously in. In Scotland and Wales, you have the Nationalists, which is another yeah. repository for disaffected left. The green issue and the wider disaffection from the left, that's a, that's a little bit harder. But obviously, if Gaza is still rumbling on by the time we get to the election, 
and Labour's position has not moved, then I think he has a problem. Some of those voters could go to the Lib Dems as well. And obviously there are lots of seats in which they are the challengers to the Tory party. The factors are quite different in terms of those yeah. blue, yellow seats where that's what the fight is. But they, they also benefit from the general strength of the opposition. And there's quite a kind of complementary pattern there. So we've, yeah, got, the, the, we've got Ed Davey sort of bringing up the rear here, but with ambitions to take quite a lot more seats yeah, this I mean, time. The, the good news for Ed Davey is that in most of the places where the Lib Dems have a chance, it's the Tories that they're going up against. And therefore, they can have actually not an especially good election campaign. And still he make can, progress. He can carry on not being an especially... Yeah. Uh, charismatic leader, and they can still make gains at the expense of the Tories in some of their southern seats. So we're, we're going to leave Ed Davey sort of getting on with his own thing in his lane. The Greens, we're bringing up the year, rear here with Starmer because of this factor we discussed. It's questionable whether the Greens will actually manage to even hold the one seat they have at the moment, yes. but they are quite ambitious. They're actually targeting two or three, yeah. but we shall see, because but, but, obviously under first past the post, it's really difficult. I think the Greens is, it's not really what they end up doing in the election. It's about what they end up doing in the months before the election, how much they frighten Labour. Yeah. You know, we've got local elections, we've got by-elections. If the Greens do quite well in some of those, which they could, he's suddenly going to find that the voices on the left of his party, and not the hard left, but just the, the soft centre left of the Labour party now, are saying... We've got a problem here. We need to be more radical. We need to be more aggressive. And that's an opening for the Conservatives. Or, or possibly even we need to enthuse because yes. one of the problems they might have with this election is a general sense of despair about the state of the country, but less enthusiasm for a positive Labour programme. Yeah, I mean, t Tony Blair always used to say that the choice in the general election is not between the Labour Party of your dreams and the Labour Party I'm leading. It's between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. And that's the message Starmer has to keep hammering home, so far has managed to do reasonably well. Now, one thing that's helping Keir Starmer is the relative falling back of the SNP under Hamza Yousaf, First Minister of Scotland, because the SNP, having dominated the whole territory in Scotland since the mid-2000s, 2007 they became mm. the largest party in the Holyrood Scottish Parliament, but they are less popular now. They have all the problems that come with incumbency, not least how they handled COVID, which we're seeing on the inquiry stand at the moment. And so as they fall back, that hugely helps Labour. And this sort of, in a way, this SNP horse, I'm not quite sure how to sort of do it visually, but this SNP horse is, is also sort of helping the the Labour horse on its way. But Sunak, for his part, has got some real problems. It's the push me, pull you strategy, as you've described, but also the presence of this party to the right, yeah. Reform, who are saying they're going to stand against Tory candidates. And of course, they stood down in 2019 in a lot of seats, thereby enabling a uh, Conservative victory or yep. certainly making it more dramatic. But this time they're going to stand against Sunak and that surely like pulls him way back again. Um, it's certainly very problematic. I mean, if you take the two different... I mean, and the SNP situation is so dire. I mean, all the things you listed, plus, of course, we're waiting on police investigations into the previous leader. Um, it's they, a spectacular they, they, catastrophe. It's, yeah. it's, it's like... You know, someone has cut a load of stitches in a woolly jumper and the whole thing is unravelling. And you can see it. You add to that the fact that Labour looks like it's going to win. So you actually have reason, incentives in Scotland if you're left-leaning not to vote SNP this election, but to vote for Keir Starmer. So, I mean, they're having an absolutely terrible time. Hamza Yusuf keeps changing the strategy on how to approach Labour. That they attack Labour for being not left-wing enough. And then on the other hand, they say we can work with Labour and part of the anti-Tory alliance. It's all over the place. Although they are still the most popular party in Scotland, right? They are still the most so it's a question of how many seats Labour can take off the SNP from its incredibly dominant position but rather than suddenly sweeping. That, but well, no, I do. Some, I do. But you, okay, you do. <laughs> but there are some polls which show the gap really getting quite narrow. And one of the important things about the way first past the post works is always where it works against Liberal Democrats. Where are your votes that, concentrated? Where are your yeah. votes? But also the, the key number for the SNP is around 40%. If they start dropping below 40%, a then all of a sudden seats. it can yeah. fall away. Right. And, and the polls suggest that could be happening. So that's the worry for them. Reform is in a way much more interesting. It, it, it's always been a shakedown party on the Conservatives. Yeah. It's always been a party to frighten the Conservatives to doing things that its leaders wish they were doing. So again, shall we just try and make clear, it's not that we're expecting Reform UK, unless something really extraordinary happens, to take seats in the Commons. It's taking enough voters away from Sunak's party to cause him serious difficulties yeah, in a lot of seats. The question though is whether they are... A lot of seats, a lot of seats. Essentially, I mean, yeah. the, the question is whether they're causal or whether they're just a response to what's happening. So yeah. is it that Reform is doing something interesting 
and important, which is pulling people away from the Conservative Party? Or is it just that people are fed up with the Conservative Party and that cohort of them are giving their votes to reform? Yeah. Now, at so the it's, moment, a, it's just a vehicle for a vehicle. protest votes, but not yeah. like all of this lot, protest votes off to the left, protest yeah. votes off to the right. They appeal also to a core of voters, you know, the, the nationalist Conservative voters and MPs in the Conservative Party who've made common cause with them in lots of ways. Yeah, and particularly on immigration. Use, particularly yeah. on immigration. And who use the threat of reform to try and scare Rishi Sunak into different policy positions, just as once upon a time the Eurosceptics used the threat of UKIP to scare the Conservative leadership into a referendum. And there's the, there's the kind of shadow of Nigel Farage yes. over all this. Now, Farage has said quite <laughs> it's clearly... It's like the scary sun in the Teletubbies, it's like it's yeah, hovering exactly. over. Well, exactly so. If you're Sunak, that's exactly what yes. he is, right? <laughs> mm. So he's sort of hovering in the background and he's insisted that he won't kind of take over. Yeah. Richard Tice's leadership of Reform UK or get too involved because he's enjoying his new life as a as a pundit. Yeah. I'm not sure what the pundits union you and I would have <laughs> to say about that. But anyway, but he's still there in the background, right? And the very thought of him scares the Tories witless. And he's and I mean, associated he's, with Tice. So he's he's not really a co-leader, but he's sort of... Well, he, I mean, technically, officially, he absolutely... He, well, he's the he, owner he's, of he's the, exactly party. the party. He's, he's the proprietor. So, I mean, so. he can do whatever he likes in the election. I was at the uh, launch of the popular Conservatives list his vehicle for pushing her policies and who turns who should be at the back but Nigel Farage here in his journalistic capacity let me tell you um but you know being interviewed in his journalistic capacity and talking to lots of people in his journalism and, and you could see the whole thing is he's hovering over that side of the conservative movement waiting to see what they look like when the dust settles after the election. You can see there are a whole load of people around the Reform Party who can sense the opportunity of some kind of reverse takeover of the Tories. And It's phenomenally dangerous, actually, isn't it, in terms of the future of the yes. party? So, so if we were going to do, because we've done the hurdles that mm. Starmer's got to get over, let's think about some of the hurdles that Sunak's got to get over. I mean, there is this whole question of, of the budget and, you know, the handling of the economy. There's also May elections... Which is likely to be terrible. Which is mayoral elections, local elections. Mm -hmm. There's the summer, which people talk about perhaps an increase in small boats in the channel. Well, I think the May elections are more important in the summer because if they're as bad as yeah. we all think they're going to be, then you just get another upsurge of discontent and panic from his own party. I've heard the theory expressed that if George Galloway... So he, Galloway so he were could to get over the budget, yeah. maybe some less less tax cuts than they thought they were going to be able to offer, but they'll, they'll yeah. clear it. But then the May elections could be really, really... Yeah, I mean, I've heard the theory put out that if George Galloway would do really well in Rochdale, maybe win or stop Labour winning, that there would be a renewed push by some Conservatives to say... Let's dash for May, before the May elections. Labour's in a mess on Gaza. Let, let's, let's go then. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still not convinced because I still think they're too far behind in the polls. But I see the argument. But, I mean, Sunak, he's having good weeks. He had a good week with Northern Ireland. He got the Stormont Assembly back. There'll be very little credit for him in this. There all, will indeed be very little do, credit for him from the electorate. All that, he can yes. do is attempt to keep showing that he is a capable Prime Minister and scare pe try to scare people at the Labour Party. And the problem he's got at the moment is he's not succeeding in scaring people about the Labour Party yet. And because to this point that voters aren't listening. Now, as we get closer and closer, maybe he will. But, you know, Keir Starmer is closing down every possible avenue for attack that he can see. Their, their first draft of their manifesto, which they're working on now, is going to be absolutely safety first. I mean, you're, you're scamming. If, if you find adjectives, it'll be a miracle, let alone <laughs> policies. It's very clear they're going to give... Rishi Sunak, as small a target as possible. I have another very valued prop here, left over from our excellent market stall episode, which you can catch on YouTube. Um, because we should also remind ourselves that the last time that Rishi Sunak faced any electorate at all, it was the Tory membership, mm. not the British electorate. And he lost to a lettuce. Liz the lettuce. To Liz, to Liz Truss, the lettuce. So, yes. you know, he is an untried... Prime Minister in terms of a general election campaign, the pressure that he will be under yeah. as the incumbent. And I mean, I, I, Where shall I put my lettuce? Le, le, you lettuce, can have the lettuce. lettuce. Uh, um, it's nearly lunchtime anyway. Let us go then, you and I. Um, yeah. It's telling that when parties replace a leader mid-term, the record of them being able to take them over the line later on is, is not great. There are exceptions like Boris Johnson, but actually, more often than not, you are seen by the public as a sort of fag-end Prime Minister yeah. of a party that's run out of steam. And so... Even if he were God's gift to campaigning, 
this would be difficult. And what we've seen is he's he's a bit stilted as a campaigner. It's not quite there. So I, I'm glad you I'm glad you got onto that territory because also in election campaigns it becomes quite important who the kind of chief I don't know trainer mm -hmm. the trainer of, yep. of the jockey and the horse might be. And S Sunak has Isaac Levido, who has a proven track record, not least in Boris Johnson. Yep. In, in getting getting Tory candidates over the line yeah, he quite comes, successfully. He comes from the Linton Crosby School of Australian yeah. campaign managers. Really hard off, nosed. Off the right, really hard nosed. Very ruthless. Very good at sort of wedge, so called wedge politics, where they just identify enough to get you the majority plus one, as it were, just enough to win. He's been very successful at that. He's very clear sighted about what the Conservatives need to do. But on the other hand, even he says it's a very, very narrow path to victory. And even he isn't. No, but it's got he, worse got than that. he said it's a narrow path to victory. And it's now become it's a narrow and steep path to victory. Yes. So, you know, what's next? Crowded around with thorn bushes, presumably. With robbers <laughs> <laughs> hiding in the bushes. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, even he's not foolproof. He's not a miracle worker. There's only yeah. so much he can yeah. do. But then Starmer has recently hired, has his chief We're going to get a call from Morgan McSweeney complaining Sue that he's Gray. the campaign chief, really. OK, but the person but who is credited staff, yes. with pulling the Starmer operation together and making it all more effective is Sue Gray, who mm -hmm. has this very, very high-ranking background in government. So, you know, you've got considerable firepower in both the main groups of trainers. And we should also say that Levido, Sunak's man, really does want to get this lettuce, really gets in the way. Um, Levido really does want to push it as late as possible, as late as possible to the end of yes, the year, because he hoping wants, that things improve. He wants people to feel a bit better off. He wants, hopefully, to see some flights to Rwanda have taken off so that Sunak's claim to be dealing with the legal asylum is working. Ideally, you'd like another set of immigration figures to show they're much lower, though they still won't be low enough for people who feel strongly about this. So all of those things do still point to going long. Sue Gray has definitely brought October, some... October, December? Or November. I just, I just think they'd be mad to go to December. Uh, November is the date that's talked about most. Right. Um, Sue Gray is bringing professionalism and organisation to Starmer's operation. I mean, her main role was to be to get them ready for government. OK, so, Robert, just to finish, if you wanted to sort of study study the runners and riders in a bit more detail, Use this propaganda. we have had this slightly ridiculous situation of the Prime Minister himself on air mm -hmm. taking a, a bet, a £1,000 bet, uh, actually in this case on whether flights to Rwanda full of asylum seekers and immigrants will ever take off from yep. the UK. And he took that bet, £1,000. Uh, and then he backed know, out of it the next and then day. He the backed, and then he backed out of it. I mean, if you were a betting man, I don't know if you are a betting man. Not much. Of what do you think? Do you think that uh, that it's worth even having a punt on anyone other than Starmer getting um, over the line? It was a stomach clenchingly awful moment when he did that. I mean, you know, a thousand quid is I can get an asylum seeker on a plane. I mean, it really was terrible. It was as if Danny Dyer had been made prime minister. But no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put money on anybody else at the moment. I think he is. Um, Coming around the fairway, and now uh, the fairway, that's golf, isn't it? It's just giving, my, <laughs> giving myself away. Coming around the last bend, he's heading towards the finishing line, and he's, at the moment, he's still out of sight. Gallop poles. Oh, gallop poles!